Greetings, Kerbinauts. This is Kerbal Space Program. I'm Bob Fitch, and this is episode number 38 of Project Odyssey, in which we are going to land our capsule on the moon. We are going to bring down our life support. We are going to rescue Hadfield from that wormhole, the other dimension, because he's about to be deposited back into our universe. Svetlana is piloting the rescue, and Neil is along as the medical assistant so that when we get to Hadfield, we can stabilize him just in case this second trip through into that other dimension has caused any additional health problems. At the end of the last episode, he had come through once, but if you remember in a previous episode to that, Hadfield actually showed up really quickly once, and then we had to wait a certain amount of time before he came through again, and by then we had our rescue ready. Well, this time it sped up. The time between his approaches is really close now, maybe just 30 minutes to an hour, something like that. The guys down on the ground, they have all the details. I'm just here watching all of it as it happens. Well, I guess I also sometimes get to act as the maintainer of reality because when our craft gets close to the ECLSS lander, all of a sudden I start getting a whole bunch of error messages. And I'll be honest with you, when I saw that it said something about the ECLSS lander being out of power, which I expected that it would be. I don't need it to have power because when I dock with it, I'm going to be docking with my active vessel here. And once I do dock, then the solar panels from this vessel will be able to power up that lander. So for that reason, my fix was I went into the save game file and I gave that ECLSS lander some electrical power that it shouldn't have. It made the error messages go away and it's not actually going to affect the gameplay or anything. It's not technically a cheat since I didn't need it. It just made the error go away and so we can go on with the game. So while we continue to use up as much fuel as we can from the transfer stage that got us here, we can continue discussing what's going on with Hadfield and his time between trips into the wormholes. Though it's going to be quicker, it still is two trips. He will momentarily blip into our universe just like he did at the end of the last episode, and then he slips back into the other dimension where time moves a little bit differently. For him, he thinks that less time is going by than we do. For us, it's going to be about an hour, but for him, it'll only be a few seconds. But when he comes back the second time, we'll be ready for him. Hopefully, if we've got our rendezvous set up correctly, after we have finished refueling the other life support lander that will be going down to the surface, Hadfield will then just appear right in front of us, exactly as it's been predicted by Joseph and Kessla, our scientists, back at Kerbin. Before that happens, our first mission objective for this flight is we want to get closer to the ECLSS lander now that it's not throwing those error messages. Get up nice and close, Svetlana will go out on an EVA hook up a pipe in between it and us, transfer over some of the plentiful fuel in our service module on the Hydra here. If we need any extra in order to get home later, we'll just be bringing it up from the surface because by then the mining operation will be underway and we'll have everything we need. We just passed one more time over that moon base. And we're almost close enough now in order to go out. But when we do, we bump into the next bug on the mission. Notice that when Svetlana goes outside, for some reason, none of her consumables are on board in her spacesuit. Well, rather than trying to track down what that problem was, I decided to just go on with the mission because I should have a couple of hours. The way TAC life support system works is if you are out of electrical power, you have a couple hours before you die of suffocation. It's not going to take me very long in order to get this set up. So whatever that bug is, we're just ignoring it. We'll go outside, grab the pipes from the box that was already on the ECLSS lander hook that up and then fly back over to our vessel, hook one up on there, attach a pipe in between the two, and then we can go back inside where we'll be safe, have plenty of life support, and not worry about that as the fuel transfer is put underway. Svetlana also takes the opportunity to wave to the camera and say hi. 
In case you didn't know, a long time ago at the beginning of this project, they decided to make these little teeny cameras and put them on all the missions and they send them outside and they kind of fly around and take pictures of everything from every different angle and that's how come we've had these great documentary photos and videos of everything that has been going on on this project. Then we move on to the fuel transfer and though it took a little fiddling to figure out exactly which fuel tanks I was going to want to take the fuel out of and which ones I want to transfer it into, we got that all sorted out and then it was time for Svetlana to go back out there and just unhook that pipe. We'll leave the pipe endpoints where they were. That's not going to cause any instability problems. They're just not that massive. Once she's got that, she can go back to her capsule and hop inside. She's waiting for Hadfield's rendezvous now, which will give us an opportunity to check in at Odyssey Station and see how things are doing over there. We had recently docked up a new module and everything seemed like it was working okay, but then something went wrong. There was a power surge in some of the systems and we don't know what they're from yet, but we do know that two of the outboard sensors have gone offline. Jebediah has gone out on an EVA to try and repair those sensors sensors to see what's happened to them. This first one here seems to have a blown circuit board, but once he has it replaced, it's functioning again, and he can go up and check the other thing. The second system seems to have gone into what's called a panic mode. That, that's what happens when the software isn't functioning correctly, and the kernel operating system for the device decides that the best thing to do is to simply shut down rather than risk any damage to the processes. He replaces a fuse and then restarts it and that one gets going again. But in both cases, there's no indication of exactly what went wrong. Naturally, anomalies are always suspected initially until proven otherwise these days, since as you can see behind us there, the anomalies are flashing all over Kerbin still. More telemetry is coming in from the satellite that's around EVE, showing that lately things have been intensifying. You remember the EVE satellite, it's this one, spinning its way through the highly elliptical orbit, going way up like it is right now, and then later it'll drop down through its polar orbit, spin past EVE, taking more readings and letting us know that things are getting worse by the day. To understand why, we will check in with the alternate dimensions EVE. This is Mother Bird to Eagle Nest, come in. We've just opened the portal on this end. Raptor 1 has gone through. We read you, Mother Bird. This is Eagle Nest. Maintain your position. Continue relaying your readings back to us as long as you can maintain the connection to their side. Affirmative, Eagle Nest. Mother Bird out. This is Raptor 1 to Eagle Nest. We are through and activating the cloak now. On my mark, in 3, 2, 1, activate. Have the science officer report to the transit room. Engineer, get into your away uniform. We're going down to the surface. Transit chief. Yes, sir. Prepare the device for four to transit to the surface. Put us down just outside the main headquarters. Activating now, sir. All right, you two take the side door. I'll keep Bill with me and we'll get in there and get them before they know what happened. Oh my, 
Well, that story is heating up, but we'll come back to it later because if you recall, we've been around the moon waiting to get this lander on the ground. And now that it has been refueled by Svetlana, we are ready to pop out that landing gear and start our descent. We had already lowered our periapsis down to just over the landing site and it is the slow burn time. I keep on flipping in and out of the map view and looking at the craft itself just because I like to look at the craft, but I can't really land that way initially. Initially, I need to keep making sure that where that orbit intersects the ground is exactly the location where I'm going to want to land. It isn't until we get nice and close where I'm coming down much slower that I can try to get down into less of a map view and more of a landing view. Four things make this landing challenging. As you can see, we're coming down into a crater, which means that I have to clear that lip. If I had been down lower to the ground, like you might normally land something going to a moon, or at least places with no atmosphere, I mean, where you can kind of skim across the surface and then just come to a stop when you're right near the ground, which is much more efficient than what I'm doing right here. Well, if I had been really close, we might have hit the lip trying to come over the edge. Another thing that makes it more challenging is we get a really slow frame rate. You can see as I'm close to the ground here now that the frame rate is just kind of chugging along and that adds to the third problem which is that this is not super maneuverable so a slow frame rate and a not very maneuverable craft means that i'm just happy to get it down even remotely close to my landing site which is problem number four you're trying to get this thing down much closer than where i actually have gotten it we'll need to deal with that later though because guess who's coming home Wormhole number two opens up and Hadfield comes through. And of course, we had previously timed his arrival to the exact moments when our craft would be flying by. Now that we have the better anomaly detection routines running back on Kerbin, we knew right down to the millisecond when that thing was going to arrive. So that's how come Svetlana can be right here, ready to zip out of her capsule, fly over there, grab onto Hadfield, who just like last time is running out of life support. We hook up a little extra bottle of oxygen that she carried over. She sticks it right onto a little hose that's connected in the back of his life support system, feeding additional oxygen into his suit, giving him enough time to transfer him back over to our capsule. Neil is on board, so he'll provide immediate medical care while Svetlana transfers over to the lander because this means that now that her first mission is done, well, the second mission, her first mission was refueling the other lander and then the lander went down to the ground. Her second mission was getting Hadfield there. And the third is to take her own lander down, hook up everything on the ground base, get the fuel flowing through the micro wormhole system that she has installed already and start refueling our systems back on Kerbin. If your memory is really good, you can go back in your mind to a previous episode where they were working on something called the Misfits device. This device is capable of creating a tiny, tiny wormhole. It's not big enough to send a ship through. It's about the size of a finger. And that's why they haven't been able to do something like open up one that they can get home. But they can open it up in order to transfer fuel from one place to another. Unfortunately, the Misfits devices are very difficult to craft. So right now there's only two of them. One of them will be here on the moon and one is back on Kerbin. I'm not sure if we'll be able to create additional ones, but we may not need to worry about it anyway. Because we are closing in on the time where we'll be able to just go to Duna and everything else that we're going to do is going to happen on Duna. There won't be any need to be doing these weird wormhole micro anomaly transfers. Okay, well, we're coming down now. We'll pop out the landing gear for this one as we prepare for our approach. However, there's a new problem. We have the same four problems as the last landing, the fact that it's inside a crater, that we're probably going to get an even slower frame rate when we get there. That will reduce our maneuverability 
and we're trying to be precise about our landing to get really close to the target vessels. But on top of that, we're going to add problem number five, and that's that this lander didn't have any life support in it when it started out. The electricity is going to allow us to keep our heaters going, and we do have oxygen, but there's no food and water. Fortunately, you can go a long time without food and water. So the idea right now is that when she gets down there, Everything can get hooked up in the few hours that it's going to take to do that well before we need the food and water. And once everything is hooked up, then she will be able to get all the life support she needs. At least we have plenty of fuel for this landing. It looks like we're going to be coming down for our final descent with half our tanks still full. If you didn't notice, and I didn't mention it at the time, but if you didn't notice when I was bringing down the life support lander just a few minutes ago, when it finally touched down, it had actually run out of fuel, and it was just fortunate enough that I had enough power in the RCS system that I could trim a couple meters per second, maybe, off of that landing speed, and so it touched down a little hard, but it touched down in one piece, and we can get that refueled later, and then just shift it over closer to the base. So yeah, we don't have an issue right now with fuel, but we do, but we are about to have a really strange different problem that I have seen before with Kerbal Attachment System, and I'm not really sure how to fix, and I haven't tried to fix it before since it doesn't happen every time, but in a moment, we're, I'm going to zoom in the screen on the base while I'm landing, and you're going to see something a little odd. Modules on the ground base pop up in the air. Here, check it out. Watch as it, you can see them going up in the air and they come back down again and fall as if some sort of force has been applied to them even though there's nothing happening. They get bounced into the air and in the low gravity they settle back down again without being destroyed, but I'll zoom in here again and you can see they land sometimes not on their legs when they go in the air. They don't go straight up. They get a little bit of torque applied to them as well, and they spin and come down in strange locations and in strange orientations. Another thing that I'll have to deal with once we get down there. As predicted, the slow frame rate is definitely affecting my ability to approach and land in exactly the spot where I want it to be. And for that reason, I'm keeping my downward descent really, really low whenever I can. So that's causing this to be a slow landing process. Fortunately, like I said before, we have a lot of fuel for this. So I'm not going to worry about it. I am going to just take my time, get myself down as gently as I can, then worry about my final position later. I'll be able to rest my fingers and look over to where I want to be, orient myself in my head, power up the engines one more time, and then just skim across the surface over to the landing spot that I really want to be in. Although I will need to eventually come back to this and rotate the craft into the correct orientation relative to the base. We have some special docking tubes that need to be pointed toward each other, and right now they're both pointing in the same direction, back toward the life support lander. I'll have to flip around Svetlana's lander so that the connection tube is pointing toward the base before we can say that that lander is really where it wants to be. For now, what I want to do is start getting things hooked up because I'm not really keeping track of how long I've been without my life support. I was thinking if that I could just get the lander hooked up to the base, then there's a little bit of life support on the base, and that would give her the time she needs to finish hooking everything else up and then bringing the life support lander over to connect to the rest of the base, because that's going to need a few hours just to get it refueled. You may notice that in between landing and now hooking things up, some of the stuff that had bounced in the air and landed not on its feet has suddenly appeared back on its feet. Well, that's because there has been a reload, I will be honest. This I consider to be a bug, and sometimes in bug cases, I'm willing to do a little bit of saved game hackery to get them fixed, and that's what I did here. I saved the game, closed it out, went into the save file, hacked it up a little bit in order to make those things reappear back on their feet, loaded the game, and it was as if the strange bug with the Kerbal Attachment 
system had never happened. My modules were back on their feet, and that allowed Svetlana to go out there and start doing some hooking up. Then she heads back to her lander and gives it a flip around so that we can align those tubes, like I said, pointing toward each other. Now once all of the pipe endpoints have been distributed all over the place, everything will be hooked up, flowing properly, and this will be a proper base. There's one or two pipe endpoints on pretty much everything out here, at least one, like on the lander itself there was one that was just an extra, I had used it previously to refuel the ECLSS lander, which is now down and doesn't need to worry about that anymore. So I grabbed that just because at this point I'm willing to take whatever pipe endpoint I happen to have nearby. I know there's so many of them, it doesn't really matter which one I grab. So whichever one's nearby, we grab that, reposition it, to whatever angle it needs to be positioned. Keep connecting one after the other. We have the drill hooked up, the generator hooked up, the batteries hooked up. In a moment, we'll get it hooked into the main lander that even has some greenhouse inflatable bays on there. Then, after activating one of the disabled batteries that I keep specifically for the purpose of getting a little extra power when you need it, that gives me what I need to go and turn on the drill. Now the drill is an interesting little hack job that I did because it is a carbonite drill, but drills as if it were cathane. Both of the drill types are actually part of that same model. The cathane one hides inside the carbonite one and that's what allows me to have my cathite. Okay, next up, that ECLSS lander that we just flew over, it needed to move closer to the base. And I did that by transferring fuel over there very, very slowly. And then once it had been refueled, lifted it off and flew it closer. Didn't actually show that because it was kind of boring, uneventful, just sort of skimmed across the ground at a very, very slow pace until it sort of bumped into Svetlana's uh, personnel lander. In fact, when it was taking so long to move the thing because of the slow frame rate and the slow speed I was moving it, I simply just turned off the camera and said, oh, whatever, well, once it's in position, I'll turn the camera back on. So that's where we are here now, where Svetlana can go into her personnel lander and move it onto the other side of the ECLSS lander so that we can hook up the personnel conduits between those two new parts. Still seeing those life support warnings for food and water every time we get out, but I imagine it won't be long now before we won't be seeing those. Everything is so close to hooked up. This is getting good any moment now. The best part about it from Svetlana's point of view is most likely going to be that those fresh produce life support units you can see in the background are going to be providing her with some tasty fresh fruit and vegetable type snacks. As I understand it, that is the most exciting point in an ISS in our world shipment that goes to the ISS whenever they send any new supplies there. They also bring a little bit of fresh fruit and vegetables. And since they can't grow anything on the ISS yet, they're still working on that new tech. That means getting shipments from our real earth is the only way to do it. And likewise, over here, the only way we're going to be getting fresh fruit and vegetable snacks is through those inflatable units. Speaking of which, we are fully connected now, so we should be able to check our resources and make sure the power is coming in. I tried to be relatively realistic about how much food they could get out of those by looking at how much acreage it takes on real earth to grow enough food for one person for one year. And then I set my life support income rates equal to something similar to that. I think I allowed it to be condensed to even two or three times what you could do on earth. But that still means that this would not be totally a self-sufficient location. It just takes a lot of acreage to supply one person for a whole year with fresh food. I don't think we've checked in with what the jewel scoop return looks like. So we'll stop here in the VAB real quick and look at that. You remember that this was a really, really tall vessel. We had the solid boosters at the bottom, one of my larger extended stages here through the middle. And then once that was removed, there was yet another one up here, but this one has a nuclear engine. And that's because this whole huge thing here 
is one leg of our return journey. This is going to be the one that I believe brings us back. Once we've rendezvoused, the rendezvous will be carried out by the transfer stage that you've seen previously and is the other half of what's docked up here. This one being the return also contains up in here the re-entry part of the ship. So let's take a look at that. There we are inside the fairing. And you saw this last episode where we were strutting up. I had the extra struts here, little plates inside there to make it solid because it was hard to get it to attach to anything otherwise. Strut endpoints on the plates and then ones that I could take away by Joseph who would grab the one side, go up, connect to the other vessel, and then link it back down here to this side, providing a nice solid structure. And that's because this little space tug in between is not going to be solid enough on its own. This is a space tug just like the one that I have up at Odyssey Station right now, except that I had scaled it down. It's normally a little bit bigger like that, and I scaled it down a bit because I didn't think I would need as much just to transfer with the, the rendezvous. Also, I changed the solar panels. There are circular solar panels on the other one because it doesn't really need to keep itself charged with those. It just is drawing in a little extra charge. But in this case, I may need to have it fully charge itself. So that's why I have these solar panels around the outside. The other difference is we have these right here. We have some parachutes. And that's because down at the bottom, it has a heat shield that we'll be using to protect it during the re-entry and then parachute it in like this. And then up here, dock to it will hopefully be Hadfield's medicine. We'll land it in the ocean probably and then have our ship go out and pick it up and bring it back. That'll be after Hadfield and Neil return from their trip to the moon with Svetlana right now. She's just going to stay at the moon for a while. She's going to continue overseeing that construction project, which will allow us to come back here to Kerbin and take a look at the vessel we were just watching in the VAB. Last episode, having docked it up to a transfer stage that will get us home afterward. We need to get this pointed in the right direction and then start the boost that will help us with our intercept. The Jewel Scoop is coming back next episode, and we're going to be timing up our periapsis on this orbit for the capture vessel so that it matches up with when the Jewel Scoop passes by that periapsis, and that way we can make the rendezvous. It's going to be difficult because we need to increase quite a bit of speed. I'll do as much as I can right now by each time going through the periapsis, boosting a little bit higher, taking advantage of the Oberth effect to get the most efficiency out of our nuclear engines. Once I have the apoapsis just short of escape velocity, that's where we'll stop. The next episode, we'll be able to intercept the jewel scoop. So until then, I will see you later, Gerbonauts.